Welcome everybody. Today's guest is a director and despite his young age, uh, his, his videos reach more than 3 billion views on YouTube. He received a Grammy nomination and worked with artists such as David Guetta, Arcade Fire, Arctic Pig Monkeys, Dida Von Tees, Lady Gaga. I'm happy to announce David Wilson. Hello. How are you, David? I'm good. And so, I mean, when you broke into the music scene, I'd like to know how was your beginning and how did you get a good reputation in the industry during these years? Okay, so uh, I think like most people, you tend to break into an industry by covert uh, mechanisms. And what I did was I entered competitions. So this is competitions from magazines online at the time. Uh, I remember the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, who I was a massive fan of, uh, were doing a competition where you could send in some camcorder footage of yourself and they would cut it into a video. And so I did that and it escalated to the extent that uh, they invited me and my friends on stage with them at Reading to introduce them to a crowd of 50,000 people. Uh, so that, that wasn't planned, but these, these things were a useful way to like crack into the industry. I also did a competition where I made a music video for a competition for a band called CSS, a Brazilian uh, band. And then I also, uh, I, I was just obsessed with music and one of the bands that was in Brighton at the time that I was, uh, Joe from the band was two years above me at university it was a band called Metronomy that went on to do much, much bigger things. But uh, I used one of their songs with Joe's blessing uh, as my degree end piece, my, my final show piece. Uh, so that meant that when I left university, I could kind of say I've worked with Metronomy yeah, yeah, yes, CSS, and people were like, oh, cool, he's doing shit. Um, so even though it's kind of bending the truth, because there were competitions and not direct commissions, it got people paying attention. So, so it was kind of covert and sneaky. Okay. And in your videos, I mean, a really different one to another journey. There are some videos where uh, it's everything illustrated, other not. And how do you define your style? Um, well, my style has evolved and shifted over the years. I feel like I haven't done a animated, purely animated piece of my own style for about five years. But uh, I feel like my style is defined by it being quite graphical, playful, and camp. Like those things all follow through. Even in like the most drama-led piece, like Arcade Fire, We Exist, you still have a middle eight section where there are six men dancing around in high heels. You know, yeah. there's there's camp in there and there's cabaret and there's theatrical elements. And that goes through from a purely animated piece like Arctic Monkeys, Do I Wanna Know, to Metronomy the Bay, to more recent work like a, a Facebook commercial that I did last year uh, with Grace Jones, where we, yeah, we did a whole load of fun camp setups about personalized ads. In South Africa. So, so those seem to be a kind of common thread. I like to have fun. I like to create imagery that makes me smile, that pushes a little envelope that is a little bit risque. Uh, yeah, those, those tend to be tropes that make me excited to create work. Okay. And how do you relate to the band or the singer when you direct a video? I mean, you speak with them before, you decide the plot together. How, how is the job? Every job's completely individual. Uh, so going back to Arctic Monkeys, that was all done. I just sent videos of me talking to them, like talking through, okay, these are my sketches. This is what we're going to do next. Like we had three weeks to pull that video um, together. And 
that you know there's certain things that dictated the style in that in the fact that uh it was line drawn on a black background was dictated by the time we had but anyway sorry i'm I dig i'm digressing i didn't have any direct correspondence with alex turner on that he would just send emails back via his commissioner whereas uh other artists like dave bailey from glass animals i would have zoom calls with uh paloma faith that i did music videos with in 2020 she set up a whatsapp group between me and her creative director so we were texting and having phone calls all the time like multiple times a day so it really depends the reason why i brought up arctic monkeys was that they were finishing their album when i was creating that video so they were otherwise engaged and uh mostly the uh direct communication i have is more likely to be to the commissioner from the record label than it is to the artist uh they're sometimes a little step removed but it all depends on the artist like david getter i've never met I've never talked to, I don't, I'm not even sure if I've ever received an email uh, okay. from him kind of going, thank you for the video. Um, it, it's, it's all a case by case situation, but I love hanging out with musicians and I love collaborating with them. So the closer I get with a, with a musician, uh, often the more rewarding a process it is for me. Okay, so you just named the David Guetta and that you worked for him for Titanium featuring Sia. Yes. And that was your first video that passed the billion views. Can you yes. tell us something more about that job? I mean, I think a billion views is something huge. And you it, that's not just the only one, but that was the first one, I think. If I'm... Yes, it is. Uh, I know that Arctic Monkeys has also crossed yes. a billion views as well. Uh, so that has nothing to do with me, I feel. I mean, oh. sure, maybe people like the video, but that is a huge song. And do I want to know? Had was it was like on every radio, uh, everywhere. But it, it's you bring up a really interesting point in the fact that you get sent a song, and you have no idea whether that is going to just flop and nobody's going to hear it again, or whether it's going to cross a billion views. Like you. It's very interesting to be on the other side of a hit before it goes to the radio and before it, you start hearing it in cafes and taxis and airports. It, like it's, it is amazing how a song uh, evolves once it goes out into the world and it has association with certain things like sporting events or film. Anyway, um, working on. Uh, David Getter Titanium. This was the one and only job I did with a production company called Iconoclast, which uh, at the t it, now it's worldwide, but uh, at the time it was just in France and they wanted to sign me. So this was a kind of experiment between me and them to kind of test out and do a job together. So uh, they put a lot of time and effort into this they wanted it to go as well as it possibly could and at the time there weren't really that many narrative videos around um this was god i forget the exact year but i want to say it was around 2011 and i was really excited to make a scene from a movie and uh so i kind of took this spielberg approach which now when you look at it in hindsight you're like oh it's a stranger things type video but it this is like five years before stranger things <laughs> so uh yeah i wanted to do a film a section from a film and i liked that you know lyrically we had the words titanium you shoot me down i won't fall it just it spoke to me about something super supernatural something a bit kind of x-men marvel that's what i lent into um and then that's yeah that that's kind of where it all sprang from i just kind of made a scene from a movie and made it as spielberg and 
and, and fantastical as I could. And then, uh, and then, and then we went and made it. I think this is first job that I did abroad. This is probably the first, I think, it, yeah, it was the first video where I got flown to North America. So we shot it in Montreal and that was extremely exciting for me. It felt like I was flying into my imagination and being from the UK, everything that almost seems like American tropes, uh, you know, the locker uh, corridors in the high school, uh, the police cars, the even just the way the trucks were, the neighborhood that the kid uh, cycles through, all those things are so exciting to me because it just felt like I was flying into movie land you know I just kind of saw North America as being movie land at that time in my life so it was a it was a very exciting job for me and I guess a certain extent that follows through into the the film that I made people seem to connect to it over the years I've had kids send me uh you know iPhone made music videos that they've recreated of the video but them messing around in their bedrooms or on their street like pe yeah people connect to it and and I have had some very nice emails about um you know there's a father that watched it with his son and it meant that he reconnected with his son in a way that he hadn't done for years and it I mean it's it's a very special song as well it kind of it made Sia go stratospheric. Uh, it was very interesting seeing that happen. Like before Titanium, she was more of an indie artist, ghost writing for other artists like Beyonce. But then post Titanium, she became the Sia that we know. Okay, exactly, exactly. And another great year for you, for you was in 2015 because you won uh, three UK Music Awards with uh, Out of the Black Barrel of Blood, that it happened yes. by Tim Impala, and another one as Best Director. In, this, in the same year, you've been nominated also for Best Music Video at the Grammy Awards for We Exist by Arcade Fire. And in this video, we have Andrew Garfield that plays the role of a transgender woman. And how did you get the idea of the story? And uh, I'd like to know, how did you cast Andrew Garfield for, for the role? He was already really famous. He already was Spider-Man during that period so and i think uh that's the only video that he where he plays yeah i think you're right i think uh i think that might be the only music video that he's in so uh 2015 was a stratospheric year yeah yes. one that uh was very very exciting to live through uh i remember going to the grammys just really you know it really felt in my head like this this is probably the only time this is gonna happen to you <laughs> like really <laughs> no. really drink drink it, it well you, 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 that's what it felt like um uh really drink it in um it's it's very weird like with the uk mvas i felt like i'd done really good work like in 2014 my uh Arcade Fire video was entered into the competition and it wasn't even nominated for anything. In previous years, like uh, my video for Metronomy the Bay uh, got nominated for something but didn't win. And I was like, oh, fuck. I, I just felt like I hadn't won anything at the UK MVA since 2009. And I felt a bit disillusioned with it. And uh, I didn't know what else I could do to make a video to really like make an impact at that awards. And then 2015, the, the table just turned and, and I, I just <laughs> got, got a lot of awards that year. Um, so going to Arcade Fire, We Exist, uh, how that came about, how the aftermath played out is something that is very interesting to talk about because it's still something that I kind of carry with me. Arcade Fire are, are a huge band. And at the time they were, I feel the biggest alternative band in the world. Uh, they have a lot of celebrity fans. It's kind of bonkers 
when you go to the uh the green room after their show or any kind of after party and it is just a kind of a-list who's who of cool celebrities uh that are hanging out uh backstage so Andrew and the band were already friends like Andrew had visited their studio when they were recording Reflector uh they were already connected so going back to how the concept came about uh I got sent the track and when Butler from the band had this idea of he wanted to do um red uh, drag queens kidnapping rednecks and forcing them to dance on live tv that that was his brief and I thought that was really fun and then I listened to the song and it was way deeper than something that was you know to me drag queens kidnapping rednecks and forcing them to dance on TV just kind of felt very uh, a, a little bit too top level, a little bit too kind of fluffy. And when you listen to the lyrical content and also the progressions within that song, it just felt like you could go a lot deeper. So there's still dancing rednecks, but the character had evolved from drag queen to someone that was exploring their gender identity. And uh, this is where Andrew came in. You know, we were discussing who could play that role and Arcade Fire suggested Andrew. And I was like, oh my God, this is great. Um, this, or, it, at the time, Andrew was in between um, promotional, a promotional tour for Spider-Man 2. So he'd just done Europe um, with his iconic kind of floppy hair. And then uh, he came to do our video. And the first thing he wanted to do was, I'm fed up of doing this, you know, I'm fed up of doing this promotional tour. I just wanted to shave my head. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that'd be great. But um, you need to make sure <laughs> we're not going to get in trouble for that uh and so you know we we made sure uh his management knew and everyone was cool with it uh but uh that was part of the reason of him shaving his head at the beginning of the video was this kind of uh this push away from being a product for for spider-man essentially and, and the movie and the tour um and in the lead up to it what was wonderful is that I brought on my friend, Our Lady J, who's, um, she's actually the first transgender writer for TV. After doing the video with us, she went on to write and become a producer on a show called Transparent for um, Amazon. And uh, then on for a, a show called Pose, which became uh, massively popular about yep. the um, New York ball scene, ballroom scene. Um, so this is where the casting of Andrew became, um, you know, having, having Our Lady J there was brilliant. Not only could she bring her own real life experience as a transgender woman to Andrew, she could guide him, guide us, and also vouch for our process. But a lot of the kickback from the video was that we had cast a cisgendered male in a role that is a, a, a transgender role. Um, the, the video got a huge amount of attention because Andrew was in it. And Andrew gives a phenomenal performance. Like, uh, I remember articles at the time being like, it, it's his best performance of his career. And it was very exciting for all of us, but um, the kickback on the fact that we had cast a cisgender male rather than a transgender woman in this role uh, was, um, was something very difficult to navigate. And it still feels difficult to kind of talk about to a certain extent because it was such a kind of 
uh, you're really in front of the firing squad of a, a, of a lot of people feeling a lot of hurt. For us, we were always exploring someone that was at the beginning of their exploration uh, with their gender rather than someone that had started taking hormones. Um, but that, you know, it, uh, this, that video wouldn't be made that way today. Uh, we would be casting someone that is between genders or someone that is transgender. Uh, and that's, that's slightly difficult to look back on and kind of go, oh, well, Andrew brought a lot of attention, but was, was it right to cast a cisgender person in that role? The reality is, is that nobody was talking about transgender people or transgender issues in 2014. This is still very early days. It's difficult to believe that now in, in 2022, but um, there was one bit where someone put a comment on YouTube going, uh, I never really related to the LGBTQIA plus community and definitely not to trans people, but I relate to Andrew Garfield and I relate to Arcade Fire. And through this video, those two mechanisms have meant that I've found myself being able to relate to transgender people. And, you know, there's certain things like that where you're like, okay, well, that was a good thing. But the amount of hurt it also caused through uh, transgender actresses and actors not being uh, put in that role in such, in such a pivotal music video um, is, uh, is something that I, you know, I'll, I'll always have to live with, I guess. So even though it was a hugely successful video, it's still, it's still something that, um, you know, that I, I live with in that way. Okay, thank you for your answer. So, and another big success, you already said it before, is Do I Wanna Know by Thick Monkeys. That's a completely animated music videos, okay? And if you can tell us something, even, something more even about the, this video, the process that was behind. Oh, the process behind it was yeah. its own unique adventure. So the Arctic Monkeys were scheduled to headline uh, Glastonbury Festival which is the biggest music and arts festival in Europe. And it was a big deal. They were coming back with potentially a new album, but at the time they were going, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna play this new song and we want some visuals that will blow people's minds on the screen behind us. So I pitched, do I wanna know as concert visuals? And then as we started to work on it, um, the band's tactic kind of changed and they're like actually we're gonna concentrate on finishing the album and this song is going to be released as a single so these concert visuals now need to be escalated to a higher level so that they become a music video but we can't be in it like we're just way too busy we're in the studio we're finishing the album so it's one of the very few, if, if own, I think it might be the only Arctic Monkeys video where the band aren't in it. So it's very unique in that way. And it's because of the circumstance. So these concert visuals then evolved into being a music video, but the timeline was short. We had about three weeks to pull it off. So all those things uh, resulted in the execution that we had for the video. It feels really bold watching the video still that you've got such a huge song and yet for the first minute it is just a visualizer. It's just like a wiggly line which then evolves into something grander. Uh, but it, that song is just so powerful and so impactful that it works. Uh, the concept around the drag racing and the girls came from Alex and the band. 
uh, they would send over references of the kind of look, the kind of cars, the kind of 70s aesthetic. And uh, I was very into that as well. So that all came together. Um, the artwork in terms of the oscilloscope wiggly line that makes the album cover for AM was a design that was original. The concept came from Alex. Uh, he was in the studio and he was seeing the wiggly line of the oscilloscope and going, oh, we should uh, we should do something like that or with that and kind of squiggled it out and made the AM logo that was then made a bit neater by a graphic designer, I think. Um, but uh, it's something very interesting about the Arctic Monkeys that Alex is so multidisciplined, like I don't think people know that in um, his, oh, is it Tranquility Base Hotel, the last album, there's a model hotel that's uh, on the album cover. And my friend, uh, Steve, works at Domino. And I was talking to him about it. And Steve said, uh, it, joking, walking into the office, seeing the model on the table, he goes, oh, I bet Alex built that. And he had, like Alex Turner had built the model that, is the album cover and Alex had designed the AM album cover. He's so, he, that man is a very smart man. Anyway, I'm digressing, but we needed, the brief was, initial brief was we needed to connect visually to that album artwork. And I, I, I heard that other people had pitched on it, like uh, doing, things with spraying water and hose pipes and 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 strange things like that but um I just thought the the design was so powerful and simplistic that being able to work with that and then pull in psychedelic references like the animator Vince Collins was a huge influence on that video if you, if you don't know his work I think like it's quite hard to find on YouTube but it is there um amazing hand-drawn animated uh psychedelia there's specifically one film called uh malice in wonderland that is is really trippy and very sexual uh but you can see his uh influence in the video that we made as well uh and the main thing is, is that it all just had to come together really quickly. So I think I storyboarded it in the crudest way possible, but like storyboarded it over a weekend and then was briefing all the animators. We had 15 animators working on it, I think at one point. Um, simultaneously, everyone at their different stations, but also people working around the world. Um, so I think we had a animator in India and we had other animators in the US and it just meant that I was continually checking in with all these different animators pulling it all together uh, it was quite a race to the finish but it's a wonderful film uh, it's still one that I'm very proud of yeah yeah and you just said that in these videos the Dark Team Hawkins didn't appear the band but that's something Correct. that I noticed that it's really common that in your videos, the band of the singer, they don't appear performing. Sometimes, yes, but a lot of times they don't. I'd like to know why, because that's something unusual to me. Yeah, it's uh, actually just come from the brief from the band. Like some of my most well-known work is the work that I did with Tame Impala. And at the time, Kevin was like, I am not interested in appearing in a video I don't want to be in a video um that's shifted now um in the most recent album he's in all the videos but uh that that was a brief from the band Art Monkeys it was a brief from the band um and I guess when you start making film music videos that are well known for not having the band in them then people kind of go oh well that that's what he does um so there's a certain element of that but it's also worth remembering that these videos were videos that came out um you know probably eight years ago now something like that and uh this is a different landscape I think this leads on to 
one of the things we're talking or potentially going to talk about, uh, which is the difference between the landscape previously in music videos and to where we are now. When I work with the musicians now, they are so savvy about the whole circus. They are so savvy about uh, social media, about how th their visual representation. Uh, and at the time, still in like 2013, 2014, YouTube was there, but it wasn't as big. It was no way near as big an impact as it is now. And, uh, you know, sites like Instagram were basically almost non existent. So, uh, it meant that the visual video side of the work was a lot looser. It wasn't so important to their marketing campaign as it is now. And with that, we were able to have a lot more freedom in what we did. And it didn't seem so vital to the artists to get engaged. Also, I'm not really doing pop videos. Like in the last few years, I've started to do more like Paloma Faith and Christine and the Queens, but mainly the bands that I was working with were bands that were like, we're not really interested in being in front of the camera. Like we make the music, you do the visuals. That works great for us. And it certainly worked great for me because there's only so many ways you can film someone playing the drums. Uh, and that, that was a big priority for me. I was like, I want to tell stories. And I, when, when briefs came in where it was like, oh, we want the band heavily featured, uh, I, I, I kind of struggle with those scripts anyway, because I, I, I just don't find it very interesting watching someone sing a song or play an instrument unless they are extraordinarily uh impactful so even with the work that i did with glass animals in 2020 dave is in the videos but in essence i've used him like an actor so he's uh we did a scene where he's just about to jump into a swimming pool and then ends up jumping into a swimming pool for the song. It's also incredibly loud. And then we did a film where he plays every member of a family on a car journey. Um, and in essence, that was just like, great. Oh, <laughs> I have this short film script. I can use Dave as an actor and the lyrics fit really well. Um, so uh, yeah, I, it, it doesn't really interest me shooting someone singing. Okay, okay. And I mean, what's the difference between directing a video 10 years ago than today or when you started than today? You just said that the world in this changed a lot with YouTube, with the social media. Do they impact your video clips, the technique, the, the, so everything? I mean, what's the difference between then and now? Oh, it's huge. So one of the main things that, I mean, I read an article about this and it may or may not be right, but it certainly made us a lot of sense when I read it uh, a while back. And this was that when I started out in 2010, that kind of era, when I really kind of got my teeth into music videos, the main route in which music videos were spread was, you know, it was making a viral video. And this was spread through blogs and headlines. So you'd be on a blog and the headline would be, see such and such an artist in this new video where they play a rabbit and you go, oh, that's weird. I want to see, you know, this uh, artist playing a rabbit. And you are sucked into the music video by the headline narrative thread and now the clickbait for you to watch a video is not from a headline it's from a visual because everything comes from tiktok instagram little clips of a bigger video that is purely visual and so as a result i feel like 
a lot of music videos have become way more visual candy and uh, the brief and the treatment needs to be a lot more orientated visually than it is with words so that when an artist looks at it they go great I can see 10 different setups four different looks I'll get this you, you, we'll get a lot of mileage out of this video um and uh and that's very different to the way that I I work and the way that I shaped my work so uh, back when it was a headline that was brilliant because it just meant that you wanted to make the most engaging story and it was all about the pacing of the video uh to me it was going okay every 30 seconds something needs to change I need to take the audience on a journey this needs to link to the music uh I was very much engaged in in that kind of progression and thread um and that just feels a little different now um so what works really well for me is when artists come to me going we love the videos that you did and uh, we love your work and we'd like you to be you and you to work with us and that's amazing so for for me working now uh it's I'm in a very privileged position that the main music video work that I get tends to be when I'm connecting to people that are already fans of my work, which is very different to when I was working 10 years ago when, uh, you know, I didn't have the reel that I have. So you have to kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to, to kind of uh, craft these new ways in. Um, but it, in, in the short of it, I feel like it allows me to still make the music videos I want to make uh, because people engage with me on the level that I want to progress into. But uh, it means that I'm not doing so many of them because the music language, that the music video language that I speak is quite different now to what is currently going on. Do you have any artists with whom you'd like to work that never happens is now? Uh, yeah, um, I'd love to work with, who, on the top of my head, the first person that came in was Lizzo. I okay. think she'd be such a vibe to work with. Um, the main people I want to work with are just uh, kind of personalities and people where I feel like I would really connect to and with be on the same wavelength. So, uh, yeah, Lizzo would be amazing. Um, trying to think who else is really exciting me at the moment. Oh, well, there's, there's this guy called Only Fire who is uh, amazing. Like his work is, um, it fuses kind of pop beats, like Ed Sheeran type beats, but with the voice, female voice of Siri uh, talking about explicit adventures. Uh, and it's so filthy and it's so out there and brilliant, but the beats are so good and the narratives are so engaging. I really want to do something with Only Fire. Um, I still want to be working with Glass Animals. Um, I still like there is, there are just certain bands where they're where it's like if they call me I drop everything and I do stuff so um that applies with the majority of artists that I've worked with in the past so if Arc like, Arcade Fire ring I drop everything and I do it if Glass Animals ring I drop everything and I do it if Arctic Monkeys ring I drop everything and I do it Tame Impala you know that when you've got the, that established relationship it's very exciting to dig back to, back into it because there's a mutual love for each other um so so those those are the main ones like kind of anyone that's break you know kind of breaking things like only fire 
anyone that's established, but playing with camp and fun, and I know we can have fun together, like Lizzo, uh, or anyone that I have had a previous relationship with. There's also, because as outlined earlier, um, of me winning that competition with the yeah, yeah, yeahs and ending up on stage with them in front of 50,000 people when I was 21, I just want to do a yeah, yeah, yeahs video. I just really want to work with them. It would just be amazing. So that's always been uh, on my list as well. Okay, and do you have an advice for someone who wants to pursue your career? Someone that is yeah. starting now? Yeah, um, it just don't, don't do what everyone else is doing. Um, I feel like that's my advice that I can continually try and tell myself and it's the most difficult thing because you have this voice in your head going oh but if I write this it's just I just feel as if I'm shooting myself in the foot because it's not what people want but then whenever I've done that and it does get approved it it makes shockwaves because it's fresh and it's new like when I handed in my treatment for um Tame Impala let it happen I was really bummed I was just like I have this opportunity to write on the biggest rock song of the decade. And all I can think about is someone dying of a heart attack. Like what the fuck's wrong with me? But I, uh, it was all I could think about and I handed it in and I was like, oh, okay, well, that was that, that's a shame. And I went for a walk and then uh, I got a phone call going, the band love it like you should do this and uh and then I got really really excited because I realized I was doing a music video with really you know um what I felt was quite thought-provoking content of this man being overworked to the extent that he had a heart attack um for the biggest rock song of the decade and it was a film and it was you know we got to go out to Kiev and and shoot in multiple locations and shut down an airport and it's it's uh sometimes those things become a reality and uh the other bit of advice is to hold yourself to the standard of your of the people that inspire you just because you're starting out with, you know, a hundred euros or a hundred pounds to do a video for your friends doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, you should still plan in the same way that your heroes plan, like really craft it, like preparation is key to everything. And I just put hours and hours and work into the nights preparing and preparing and preparing even on the lowest budget pieces especially on the lowest budget budget pieces really because it's all you have is the knowledge that your preparation will shine through in the film enjoy the process be motivate yourself but don't be too hard on yourself and build a community around you because there will be moments where you don't get any work for like six months eight months a year and there will be moments when you get loads of work and you can't breathe for the amount of work that's coming in at you and this is a pattern that continues throughout your whole career and it's really difficult because it's so bipolar it goes from being really intense to you you know not not having anything to do really other than your own self-initiated work and if you aren't able to connect to others around you other directors especially uh it can be a very isolating experience so make friends with other directors and that will hold you in good stead for when the going gets good and when the going gets tough yeah that, that's nice what you said i mean i hope and i'm sure that someone that is listening now will will do something that you just said i mean your words are were really important i mean 
I remember when I was younger and I was starting working in show business, I mean, hearing that thing for someone that was doing the job I wanted to do, it's really important, you know? I mean, how do I start? I mean, because when you start, then, okay, I know how to do this one. I know how to do that thing. And you start growing up. But even to me, the beginning was the hardest part. Yes. How? Yes, how? absolutely. How do I? How do I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do I do it? Uh, you just, you just got to do it. And this is why I started in animation. Like, I didn't know how to make a film look good, but I could draw. And so I didn't particularly want to be an animation director, but I could draw and it could make a product that looked okay. It looked good. And then as soon as I could, I transitioned into live action when I knew I could make a product that looked good because we had a production infrastructure around me that meant that we could bring on, you know, shooting on a cinema camera and all that stuff so be at ease with the fact that your limitations uh you'll always have limitations you know you won't have access to the best cameras your crew may be asking your best friend or your mum to hold the camera like it's it, everything is scrappy um but knowing that uh some of those things can be your kind of greatest assets and learning how to make the best of limited resources is uh something that holds you in good stead throughout into the future and beyond like uh, I was hanging out with uh, my friend Daniel, who's one half of the directing duo Daniels at the weekend, and we were talking about their latest movie. And the movie's got a whole load of stunts in it. It's got like kung fu uh, fight sequences in it. And uh, they were just thinking about what resources they had when they wrote the script. Like they had a friend who's their art director, and they knew that the art director had a vending machine with a removable front and they're like great we can use jason's vending machine and there can be a moment where someone like gets thrown into it and the glass smashes so even though they're doing a multi-million dollar feature film they're still thinking in that same grassroots way of what do we have already and like using that in the scripts and the films that you want to make rather than, you know, I want to build everything from scratch because you're just shooting yourself in the foot. If you can already build on the things that are naturally around you, it's going to be more you, more uniquely you, uh, and, and really amazing and surprising for the viewer because they're not to know that your friend Jason had a vending machine with a removable front. They'll just think, wow, they spent a whole load of money on that thing but how they only had 20 pounds so um yeah i hope that helps also yeah so david what are your plans for the future uh my plans for the future are to uh, like commercials are really solid ground base for me so i will continue continue to make commercials uh, I enjoy them I enjoy the process I enjoy working with like there are good guys in the industry believe it or not and I really love working with them with good scripts and going traveling and and all that stuff so you'll be seeing more commercials from me um, you'll be seeing more music videos from me when those situations arise where people want me to do what I do or I work with bands with an established relationship. I feel like I want to be exploring more narrative based videos again, rather than uh, doing too much performance stuff. Uh, I feel like with doing Paloma Faith and Christine and the Queens, I do get a lot of uh, requests to do female artists now, um, which is no bad thing. It's just as with anyone, I just want to work with the most interesting people. I want to make a short film um, 
kind of exploring the same vein as I did with my last short film called Deep Clean, where I worked with a cabaret artist called Harry Clayton Wright. And uh, I'd like to see where I can push and explore that. Um, so there may well be personal work that comes out in the next year with some more sexual content, uh, which will be really fun. Um, and then uh, be open to the winds of, uh, you know, wild and wonderful requests that come in. Uh, no day is the same. Even now, like as we're having this call, I might have received an email that's gone, oh, there's this script from this company that want you to make this kind of film out here. And it may be something I've never done before. And those projects are very interesting to me as well, where someone sees the potential of, we know you've never done this, but we'd like you to, uh, to try this different route because we like your taste. Like I almost made a pride campaign for a soft drinks company where it was all dialogue based and it was all a, um, it was a party scene. And I was really excited to do that. Um, it didn't come, it didn't come out like uh, I, I lost the job to someone else, but um, those, those requests that take me out of my comfort zone are things that I engage with and like to engage with. So I always leave a bit of space for the unexpected, uh, which is something you can never predict. Thank you, David, for this conversation. And uh, I mean, I'm really happy that I had you as a guest. You know, we spoke for a lot of times and we finally <laughs> get it. And thank you for av availability, for what you tell to us. And uh, well, that's everything I can say to you. That's great. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.